So let's go, let's go ahead and get started. And you know, we may take a couple breaks here and there just to see if people need to get admitted in. So what we're going to talk about today, I mean, I could have spent so much time, so much more time putting this together and and I kind of get frustrated because it's like, ah, oh, there's so many things to talk about and it's so interesting and exciting, but it's just, I got to stop somewhere because <laughs> we have other things we got to do. And like, you know, there's so many more important things, but I feel like this is an important topic simply because wheat and grains and oils and all that is probably the biggest problem with what we have going on with the modern food supply. And if people were just awake to that without even, you know, going through an SHT program or, or anything, if they just made this effort to minimize or eliminate grains and these highly processed oils, what you have left is relatively better stuff. And so I, I just think it's really important to understand how bad these things are for us and why. So I think starting out, it's always useful to connect with what we want. And I think most of us will agree that the things that we want are relatively similar. You know, we want some body composition changes. We want better performance in the gym maybe. Um, and we want better overall health. And so as we go through this process, that's our leverage for making better decisions. Um, the big takeaways that I want us to take away from um, this grain section, and then we'll finish up with this highly processed oils piece, is that grains are a cheap source of calories that are mainly carbohydrate based with minimal nutritional value, right? So there's just not much of an argument for, for consuming grains from a nutritional standpoint. Um, all grains are gonna have anti-nutrients or what might be considered uh, plant defense mechanisms. What up, Thomas? We got Thomas up in here. I'm gonna give it just one second, let his audio connect. What's up, Thomas? Howdy. All right, so we're starting this thing up. We just made it to the second slide here. Um, so, um, and if you, as always, uh, this is a small group. If you got any questions, comments, you can just chime in um, and, uh, unmute yourself. So, so the big takeaways before we get into some of the detail is again, like grains are a cheap source of calories and they're mainly carbohydrate based with minimal nutritional value. So there's not much of an argument from a nutritional standpoint to consume them. Um, and, and then there's the problematic factors. We have what we know, uh, what we call anti-nutrients or plant defense mechanisms or natural toxins. Um, and these things cause inflammation and digestive issues and skin issues, and they inhibit the assimilation of beneficial nutrients. Whole grains do have slightly more nutrients because you're consuming the shell and the seed, uh, the whole seed, the whole, the husk, but it's not enough to make them worth consuming. It doesn't make them nutrient dense. So just because they're a, they have a little bit more nutrients, this is the whole grain argument. Brown rice is better than white rice because it has more nutrients. It does have more nutrients, but how much more nutrients? Not much more at all. But then the more we move towards whole grains versus refined grains, we may be getting more nutrients and it may be more whole, but we're also getting more of the anti-nutrients that we're trying to avoid. So, um, you know, today's wheat and grains are very different from grains of the past and they're prepared differently. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a little plug here towards the end. Like we can experiment with some different breads if they're sourdough based and they're made traditionally. I did an experiment here recently because I have a patch of eczema that flares up in my knees and on my foot anytime I have, even like a gluten reduced beer or something like that. And I had, me and Arnica had a significant amount of sourdough bread one day just to try it out. We found a local guy that makes it uh, traditionally and uses some ancestral strain of wheat. And I didn't notice anything from it. So, and I'm, I'm cautious to put that out to the group and to the community because I don't want us to go crazy with it, but it, it proves that there's a difference in, in the way that we prepare things and the way things used to be. And if I can remember, I also want to talk about a biblical context when it comes to grain and bread, because I used to get to this all the time. And uh, I remember my father used to always say, you know, but we used to consume these things in the Bible. And, and so I got this really good little compilation put together. So um, if we look at the, the popular modern methodologies, real food methodologies, right? Um, every single one of them eliminates grains. So that right there should tell you something. And People that are smart vegans are very cautious with grains. Like they have a, a certain perspective on how they prepare them and how much they include in the diet. So, you know, that, I, I think that by itself should tell us something. There's one book that I left out here and it would be uh, um, Paul Jaminet's Perfect Health Diet. 
And he's the guy that introduced the concept of safe starches to us, you know, and, and he goes into detail about a lot of the anti-nutrients. I mean, all these guys do, but he, he does a really good job of talking about it. So, so let's first just, and, and some of this is, is reiterative and repetitive, but it, I think it's good to hear it anyway. Let's just first confirm, you know, why is it that we eat food in the first place? Because we're looking for nutritional value and we're looking to create energy in a certain way, all right? That is the purpose of eating food. Now, a few years ago, we did this uh, talk on a concept that we, we came up with and we invented, which I'm really proud of us for it. It's called nutritional vitality. And this was our way of assessing different foods based on nutrient sufficiency, meaning how much nutrient value does this food give us? We also want to assess it, assess a food based on toxicity level. So when we say our purpose of eating food is we're eating for nutrients and we're also eating to create energy in a certain way. What's implied with that nutrient piece is we're also avoiding toxins. We could almost put that in there, right? So we can assess food based on their nutrient value, based on the level of toxicity. Um, and by the way, the reason that's important is because toxins are pretty much the opposite of nutrients because toxins damage cells and tissues and organs and organ systems. They inhibit the assimilation and usage of nutrients and they deplete nutrients because of detoxification. So it's like, you know, if, if nutrients are what we're looking for, toxicants and anti-nutrients are in the opposite direction. Then we can assess a food based on metabolic efficiency or how it contributes to uh, this idea of metabolic flexibility and fat burning. Now, just because something does not, doesn't mean it's off plan because obviously we have some carbohydrates and things, but we'll go through some, uh, some examples because I think that may be a new concept for a lot of us. And let me just make sure that we don't have anybody that's kind of in standby over here. I think I get a little notification when people try to pop in. Okay, cool. So um, how do I get out of my presentation if I want to? There we go. All right, I'm just making sure we don't have anybody trying to get in. All right, cool. All right, so let's, where are we at? Where are we at? Where are we at? Sorry. All right, so let's talk about what are grains. Grains are small, hard, dry seeds. The two main types of commercial grain crops are cereal grains and legumes, which that's really interesting. I, I For the longest time, I thought grains just mainly meant the monocot seeds and the grass seeds, um, but that also includes legumes. Now, the reason these things are so popular is because they're way more durable um, and they can withstand storage and transportation and storage again and go relatively unharmed versus things like fruits and vegetables and obviously like animal foods and things like that, right? So um, for this modern world and modern food supply, they're very, very, very convenient and they pack a lot of caloric density, a lot of energy value. And as we're attempting to feed an ever-growing population on this planet and in the modern world, um, they just, they're just very convenient, right? So uh, the problem is, as most of us know, a lot of the modern processed foods are made with most of these grains because they are so abundant and they're so easy to transport and cultivate and all that kind of stuff. So um, now the, the grains that are especially kind of dangerous for us are going to be the cereal grains, um, also known as monocot grains. And these are the ones that contain gluten or they're basically grass seeds. Okay. So things like wheat and spelt and oat and barley. And just thinking about it in terms of being a grass seed, you know, if I'm looking at a field of grass and I'm trying to think of, you know, trying to find something to eat in a survival situation, I just can't see myself like going to that. Maybe, maybe as a last resort, I don't know, I'm not, maybe not even as a last resort, but because we're so ingenuitive, you know, and human beings, um, you know, getting into situations where they had to find a way to make something edible and nutritious you know, we found a way to do that. But in this modern world, in this modern food supply, when we have access to everything that we want 24 seven, the question is like, what is optimal? Because now we can make the choice. We're not forced into some kind of survival situation. So let's talk a little bit about seeds and uh, what a seed is. A seed is a small embryonic plant enclosed in a covering called the seed coat. Um, and it's usually stored with some food, right? So this is basically a plant baby that's protected, right? Now, what's really interesting is there's what is known as seed dormancy. And this is very important for a plant because the plant has this seed and it wants the seed to survive, to make it to this point to where it can actually grow and then uh, turn into another plant, right? So this seed, because it's protected, there's this time that it, it needs to pass through the animal that consumed it. And hopefully, you know, it's protected enough that the animal's digestive system can't digest it. 
there's time delays, um, it's very protected. It's waiting for the proper conditions for sunlight, for minerals, for water. Um, you know, sometimes seeds can get carried away by getting attached to animals and things. You know, we've got the little, what do you call those devil horn seeds and things that, you know, sometimes we get into our clothes and pet hair and stuff like that. And that's what the plant wants, right? But we need some dormancy there um, so that it can wait until it gets into the proper conditions and then it can let down its defenses and start to grow. Now, inside the seed, we have the embryo, which is where the plant's going to come out of. And then we have uh, the germ, which is where all the or, um, uh, the endosperm, which is where all the energy and nutrients are. It's a lot of caloric value there because the plant's going to use that as it starts to grow. Um, and then you have the shell or the hole or the husk. And this is where a lot of the protection is, but not all of it, because there is some anti-nutrients inside the seed. Um, I'm, I don't know if this is a good place to talk about this necessarily, but, you know, we have these different anti-nutrients and, and they all have different kinds of names, but when you think about it, we have this outer shell that's a protection, but we also have things like phytates. So I know all of us have heard of phytates and phytic acid. Phytates bind up to specific nutrients inside, you know, here it would be in the endosperm, but in, in, the, in the seed in general. And the reason that they do that is because they want to reserve those nutrients for this growing plant, right? So the phytates are going to, so even... A whole grain advocate would say, well, if I eat this whole grain, I get all these more, these more beneficial nutrients. But the reality is you don't because they're all tied up. And the reason they're tied up is the, the plant wants to reserve it for itself. Okay. So now when the plant starts to grow, when the seed starts to sprout, all of a sudden those phytates release their hold on the nutrients and the plant or the seed in general releases its defenses. And, um, and that's why sprouting can sometimes be useful with these things. So so all seeds are going to have um, a different profile of these different types of anti-nutrients, and some are going to have more than others. So gluten is an example. You know, we've got celiac disease. We've got um, uh, non-gluten or uh, non-celiac gluten intolerance. Um, and what happens, if you can imagine the, the digestive system, um, our small intestine is, if you spread out, because we have these microvilli, right, these little tentacles all throughout our, our small intestine, and this is meant for absorption. And, uh, and this is what makes the human digestive system so powerful because our small intestine is so big when it comes to surface area. We have all these microvilli that if you actually added up all the surface area, it would be the size of a tennis court, which is just kind of mind blowing. Um, and we do this to absorb nutrients. Now, this is what some healthy microvilli look like. And they're all jam packed together, but they're very long. So that's how we get all this different surface area. And then when we consume things such as gluten, then we start to, or, or just inappropriate foods in general, we start to wear down those microvilli, we lose the surface area, but then also we start to get cracks uh, known as leaky gut or gut permeability. We get to start to get cracks in, in the intestinal lining um, because some of that is like when, when the body's encountering these toxins at the level of the digestive system, it has to flush them out. And it uses this thing called zonulin. It opens up these junctions and, um, and, it, and it produces this kind of fluid type stuff that pushes these toxins out. But in that process, these doors open up and, and this lets a lot of pathogens and toxins inside the body. So, um, so uh, the problems with a lot of these anti-nutrients is we get leaky gut, we get gut permeability, we get immune activation, and we get a lot of damage to the digestive system, which can take some time to heal. So the bottom line is, and we can apply this to every anti-nutrient found in plants, or, or specifically we're talking about plant seeds. Um, every human being reacts to gluten and gliadin uh, with um, whether noticeable symptoms are present or not, because sometimes it's a matter of uh, this accumulation over time. So I think most of us can probably remember a time when we could eat just about anything. We didn't notice any problems whatsoever. That doesn't mean that it, there wasn't a problem. It doesn't mean there wasn't some damage happening. It just probably meant that it was just some cumulative damage that was happening over time. And I got someone that's trying to chime in. There we go, Eliza. All right, so, um, and this happens all the time. When, I, when I'm working with clients, I did a talk yesterday to a small uh, mortgage company group. It was about 15 people. It so, it's always so fun to get in front of new people because they're, they're just, their minds are blown. Their eyes are wide open. They can't believe what they can eat. Um, but, but almost everyone in that room could acknowledge, hey, you know, when, when we're younger, like we, we, we're relatively healthier, we're, we're athletic. Um, we can eat a, a lot more different things and we didn't notice any problems, but it doesn't mean things weren't happening. It's like there's this accumulation of damage that happens into at some point, it's just so much that we start to exhibit symptoms that we can notice. And maybe we had symptoms before we just weren't in touch with our body. So, so and this is just an example, you know, uh, using uh, gluten. So the way that we can make seeds better 
like I said before, is um, activation and fermentation. So if a seed is waiting to be in the right conditions to lower its defenses so it can grow, that's why sprouting and sometimes adding acidic mediums and fermenting seeds can be so beneficial. Um, you know, we've done classes in the past where we did fermentation classes. Um, I went through this phase of making fermented heart, uh, roasted nuts. I think most of some of y'all might have bought some from me, but um, you know, you can soak your seeds, you can uh, sprout them, you can add an acidic medium to them, like some apple cider vinegar, some yogurt to, to initiate a small fermentation process. This is why when it comes to properly prepared legumes like beans, if we can soak them for 24 hours, it makes them so much more nutritious because it, it mimics being out in dirt and getting some water. And that starts to lower the defenses of the seed versus canned beans. You know, if you buy beans in a can, they skip that process. They just go straight into some big vats and they start to boil them. And so they miss that process of, of letting the seed lower its defenses. I have a great document here. If anybody wants it, I'll put it in the video in the course in the group associated with it. And this is, we did a talk a couple of years ago on how to go gluten-free. Um, and if you can see this here, we have grains that technically we'd say are okay to go for, which would be white rice and quinoa and buckwheat and amaranth. Um, most of us probably aren't going to mess with those things that much, except for maybe some white rice here and there, simply because our focus is eating for nutrients, right? Um, suspect things would be brown rice. Brown rice might be okay if you soaked it overnight. Um, I don't think it's, it's uh, uh, as good or, or as clean as white rice. Um, corn, as we all know, is kind of gray area. You know, some popcorn here and there from some non-GMO organic popcorn, totally fine. Um, some sprouted corn tortillas that are uh, have been nixamalized are totally fine. Um, if someone's insistent on oats, I think oats are um, relatively more less harmful than things like wheat, and especially if you soak soak them overnight in a bowl of water and maybe put a little bit of yogurt with them or something like that. So. Um, but then, of course, we got the, the grains that are the gluten grains that we'd say absolutely avoid at all costs or to the best of your abilities. So I think this is a pretty decent little handout. We go through some tips and this is all stuff that we've probably heard before. So um, I'll make sure that we have that available. All right. We got what do we got going on? Some chats here. What is the difference between brown rice, white rice and wild rice? Ooh, who is asking that? Kathy. I want the handout. <laughs> OK, if you all want. I don't know if this is a direct message to me or if it's in the group chat. So Eliza says she wants the handout. Absolutely. Kathy says, what's the difference between brown rice, white rice, and wild rice? So brown rice is white rice with the shell. So based on what we just learned about seeds, we want to remove the shell because that's where a lot of the protection is. And most white rice, the starch that's in white rice, that's all it is, is, is just mainly starch. It's relatively void of anti-nutrients. Um, and you know, if you, if you do some, some analysis of a lot of these white rice strains, especially the, um, the more ancestral ones like Jasmine and Basmati and things, there's, there's almost, there's little to no anti-nutrients in them, but they are, you know, dominantly carbohydrates or starch based. Um, wild rice is technically, technically, um, not even, uh, it's like a pseudo cereal kind of grain. It's almost in, in the same camp as quinoa. Um, we've experimented with wild rice a little bit. I don't really like the flavor that much, but it'd be something that I think would be totally fine. I think I might do a post on it at some point. So we'll post some links to wild rice, but you can look it up in, in Wikipedia and it gives you some decent info there. So, um, all right. So traditional cultures in grain. We've talked about this in some of our talks before. Um, you know, what made us human is the introduction of animal foods. Um, you know, we, we believe with a lot of certainty that we probably started out as scavengers and then became top level hunters and predators. Um, and that happened somewhere around one and a half to 2 million years ago. And then we had the introduction of fire, which now it's estimated that it went back all the way to like a million years ago, which helped us um, kind of process food a little bit better and faster and access more calories. So those two things led to the evolution of this human being that we're a part of today. Um, and it facilitated a larger brain and a smaller digestive system because we were getting nutrients directly. You know, we, instead of like a, an herbivore or a folivore or one of the primates that have these really big hindgut or foregut uh, fermentation systems, instead of taking a lot of plants and fermenting them into some usable nutrients and short chain fatty acids, now we've developed this capacity with this unique digestive system to go straight to the source. So again, we went from scavengers and from scavengers to hunters, and then we introduced uh, fire, and then we become these top level uh, carnivores and predators. So from a hunter gatherer primitive perspective, you know, things were very, very simple. And when you think about what is it that this type of person would be looking for as far as food goes, you're looking for the easiest thing that was, is gonna give you the most 
nutrient and energy bang for buck. And they kind of knew this intuitively. I don't know if they had conversations about this, but you know, they just kind of knew this with handed down wisdom, right? So, so uh, the foods of our hunter gatherer ancestors would be animals and fruits and maybe some safe plants that were some fallback foods, maybe some medicinal plants here and there. Grains were never a part of the deal they, because they never needed to be. Once we started to settle into civilization and we had the advent of agriculture about 10, 15,000 years ago, and we started to cultivate uh, you know, animal species and uh, plants for consumption, this is where we had the introduction of grains and this is where we started to produce dairy um, on a regular basis. And so um, you know, the caloric value was a benefit to these growing populations of human beings. And I think we were relatively still healthy, but this is what transitioned into what we'd consider to be the modern food supply. And most people these days, unless you're in the know, like we are, you know, food, uh, the foods that people eat are, are barely animals, you know, because we're told that they're so bad for us and a lot of plants and grains and a lot of processed foods that are made from grains. Now, since, you know, if we look at that timeline here, you know, we go up to about 60,000 years ago, that's when we had very, very robust human beings and past you know, uh, closer to where we're at down the timeline past 60,000 years, once you get into that agricultural piece, then we start to see a decline. So this is an image pulled out of uh, Paul Saladino's book. And there's a lot of people that kind of replicate this information. Um, you know, post agriculture, we went from having these very large statures and just being very, very strong human beings, Neanderthals and homo sapiens, to we actually uh, had a reduction in our stature and reduction in our brain size. And we start to see um, more and more disease and more and more uh, fragility and less fertility and things like that. And a big part of that is the introduction of these calorically dense foods that have low nutritional value and a lot of anti-nutrients. So then we get the question all the time, like, why do we see some populations do okay on some grains? And if you look at Dr. Weston A. Price's work, you know, his work, I know we've all heard of him, but, you know, he's that dentist at the turn of the 20th century around the 1900s that uh, took his retirement money and traveled the world looking for healthy populations to see how, how they lived and what they ate. And he analyzed their food with the lab. And, um, and he documented in his book, you'd see, um, you know, like the, the uh, Leventhal, the Swiss here, um, were famous for sourdough rye bread, and it was one of their staples. Now, I think that was more out of necessity than anything else, though. But the way that they made their sourdough rye bread was very different from the way that we make bread today. So it was a grain that actually survived these really, really harsh winters up here. And when they made it and prepared it, they would lay them out, they would dry them, they would crush them. And then the sourdough process is a very different bread making process. And of course they, they revered animal foods and they were, they, the Swiss are the people that made butter famous, you know? Um, they, they felt like they would hold re, uh, religious ceremonies for June butter because it had such fertility giving properties. So the difference is that traditional sourdough breads are going to use a, a usually a more ancestral type grain and sourdough is leavened using a sourdough starter, which is a fermentation process that uses the flour involved to create this fermentation process where you have these beneficial bacteria feeding on some of the uh, glucose and the starch in, in the culture. And then that uh, perpetuates to the entire dough. And then that usually takes a very long time, like hours and hours and hours, sometimes it's several days, right? That process is completely skipped with modern commercial breads. Modern commercial uh, grains have been hybridized to have more gluten. So these grains did have gluten, but they were much smaller amounts. And because of this fermentation process, those uh, anti-nutrients were mitigated. That's what fermentation does. Um, and then because it, I was trying to uh, picture it and try to come up with some kind of analogy, you know, let's say that I took a bunch of grass seeds that if I took a bunch of grass seeds off of some grass out in my lawn, and I put it in a bowl and crushed it up and, and ate it, it'd make me sick, right? If I take these grass seeds and I put it into a big vat of water and I make it really warm and hot, then over time you could see how the, the soaking of the seeds would make them uh, looser and softer and you start to see some bubbling. And so there's things breaking down and that's what happens through the process of fermentation. And that, that mitigates a lot of the problematic factors of some of these things. So. So modern breads, we, we use these hybridized grains that have a lot of gluten in them. Um, modern grains are also sprayed with a lot of pesticides and herbicides that we never used in the past. And they use yeast directly into the flour to speed up this process and they skip this fermentation process. And so a lot of, um, I, I think, anti-wheat, anti-grain people would say it's just the wheat or it's just the gluten. 
And what we, what we, I, I think what a lot of us believe now is it's not necessarily just the gluten, it's the amount of the gluten, it's combined with the pesticides and herbicides. And it's the fact that our modern day bread is not made the same way as traditionally prepared bread. And this would explain why people can go to Europe and Italy and places that still do things the way that they used to many years ago and never have a problem eating pizza or bread, right? And it explains why I can have a piece of sourdough bread that's traditionally prepared. And even though I'm very sensitive to gluten, I had no issues with it whatsoever. So um, now when we look at wheat, you know, like we went through this transition. I remember uh, uh, years ago, like Wonder Bread, White Breads were, were demonized because, you know, they're, the, they're, they're white foods and, and they're very high in carbohydrate, right? So then we made this transition to whole wheat bread, you know, thinking that it was a little bit better, right? Um, and then, you know, I think people just kind of woke up to whole wheat bread not being that much better. And now we're at the whole grain bread stage, but they all come from the same seeds. They all go through the same process. You know, maybe they just do a little less grinding. They look a little bit more brown, but they're all problematic. You know, they're all extremely problematic because we just don't, we don't make them the right way and they're, and they're not made from traditional grains. So. Now, if we come back to our little concept of uh, nutritional vitality, let me just pop in here and see if got anybody I need to pop in. No, okay. So if we come back to our concept of nutritional vitality to grade foods, then, um, and I'm really proud of this, we could look at something like a steak, a piece of steak. And again, because of the way our digestive system works and we do really well on direct nutrient assimilation, um, a piece of steak is just awesome as far as, it's actually the best that there could be almost besides maybe organs or in combination with organs because it's got everything that our body needs to, to build itself, right? So we've got proteins and fatty acids and vitamins and minerals. We've got a life force. There's a vitality. It's fresh. It's perishable. Um, when it comes to toxicity, I would say minimal to zero toxicity, theoretically. Now, of course, modern meat, just like modern anything, is going to be tainted with pollution and, and things like that. But from a, a hypothetical theor theoretical perspective, there's minimal to no problems with animal foods or with meats. Um, and then it's great for metabolic efficiency because we have basically just protein and fat. So if we look at that little nutritional vitality, nutrient sufficiency, minimal toxicity, it's great for metabolic efficiency and fat burning. If we look at an egg, we got the same thing. Egg is the powerhouse as far as nutrients go. It has minimal toxicity. And again, we can make an argument, modern eggs, you know, non-organic, but we're just saying theoretical, hypothetical, you know, before this modern food supply. Um, and then it's also great with metabolic efficiency and fat burning because it's mainly just protein and fat. And if we look at butter, believe it or not, butter has a lot of beneficial nutrients in it. It's got some great fat soluble nutrients in it and it's um, minimal toxicity. We could say the same thing about quality, but again, hypothetical and theoretical here. Um, and then it's perfect for metabolic efficiency because it is fat. That's it. Now we come into something that's real food, carb or sugar based, you know, like we got something like an apple. It has some nutrients. There is some nutritional value there. Um, and again, hypothetical, theoretical has minimal toxicity because I, I know most of us probably understand and know apples are sprayed with a lot of herbicides and pesticides, but just pretending that we're back in a time that we didn't have all that stuff or need for it, I'd say minimal toxicity, right? Uh, plant wants you to eat a fruit, so that's why it makes it taste nice and sweet. Um, and then it does have low metabolic efficiency because it is sugar, but it's a real food sugar. And it doesn't mean that it's off limits. It just means that you know, we just have to understand, we probably don't want a majority of what we do to be this, but uh, it checks out as far as nutrients and toxicity go. And then if we look at something like white rice, I'd say white rice is almost gray area simply because it's like, doesn't have much nutritional value, um, but it is a clean, safe starch. So this is why we include it in our carbohydrates, because if we want some carbs, we are eating those, that carbohydrate plate, the safe starches and the fruits, we're not eating those for nutritional value as much as we are for the carbohydrate aspect of it, right? So to make this work in a modern lifestyle, we definitely wanna take advantage of some carbs. I think most of us are gonna feel better with it. And we want, just wanna make sure those things are safe and clean. And that's why we prefer white rice over brown rice. Um, now, if we look at something like a grain, like wheat, um, yes, there are some nutrients in there. If we analyze it, we're gonna see some things that are, that are beneficial, but a lot of those things are bound up with phytates and other anti-nutrients. Um, we have a very high toxicity level, depending on the type of grain or the type of plant. Um, we have a lot of anti-nutrients, and we also have enzyme inhibitors that disrupt digestion, that discourage mammals from eating them because this is their babies, right? Um, and then also terrible metabolic efficiency because combined with those things, we have a lot of carbohydrates. So you look when you look at something like this, if we're trying to assess it based on nutritional value, toxicity, and metabolic efficiency, 
Um, it just doesn't give high scores on any of those things. Okay. And then of course, you know, we don't, we don't even have to say anything about things like donuts and hydrogenated and toxic fats and things like that. All right. So super proud of our definition of food. It's evolved over the years. It's been pretty solid for the past few. Um, and I think it's just this perfect blend of nutrition. You know, the big plates, basically a nutrient based plate and a metabolically efficient plate. We got our small, smaller amount of carbohydrates. And if we keep it from real food sources in smaller amounts, I think we keep our sanity. I think we do good as performers in the gym. I think most people are not going to feel good or do good or have um, uh, optimal health over the long term if you try to eliminate carbs completely, although you can bounce in and out of phases of low carb and, and ketogenic and things like that. So I, I just I, I think this is just a very livable, doable thing. When I was talking to this group yesterday, you know, someone had had some experience with keto, lost 70 pounds, fell off of it, came back, gained 50 pounds, you know, and I was like, so so why were you not able to stick with it? Because you get hungry, right? It's so restrictive, you can't stick with it. So it's better to stick with something that is doable for a lifetime. That gives you all the benefits that you're looking for than bouncing in and out of these super strict, restrictive and, and uh, crazy diets and protocols. So, all right. I think that's the majority of what I wanted to say around the grain piece. And then I wanna finish with, oh, and I, I wanna touch on the, um, uh, the, the Bible piece. Um, I want to finish with um, there, there is no argument for eating grains at all, you know, because they have uh, little to no nutritional value, high in carbohydrates, relatively high in toxins. If we wanted to experiment with some traditionally made sourdough, if we were going to eat some bread, that would be the way to go. Special occasion. Um, there's a place locally called Bonds Bakery, and they supply some of the whole foods with sourdoughs. And they make their, that's where we got ours that we experimented with, you know, so that would be something that you could maybe on occasion, if you were just dead set on having some bread, um, you could uh, experiment with that a little bit. Okay. But I, I'm not saying that. I know I'm saying that and it might be a dangerous slippery slope for some of us. So let me bounce over to my, uh, that. my so this is something that I'll share too. Um, and it's basically a lot of what we just said uh, from a biblical perspective. Um, grains of biblical times are much different than the grains of today. So, you know, just reiterating what we said, grains of biblical times were prepared differently. A lot of it was probably sourdough based or something along those lines, because we probably didn't, hadn't figured out the whole commercial yeast piece yet. And then um, grains were often eaten in times of hardship. And if you notice throughout the Bible, a lot of the references to meat and fat were like, they were very revered. They were used as sacrifices. They were used as offerings because they were so valuable. And yes, we did consume a, a lot of bread, um, but it was probably because we had to, not because it's something that we necessarily thought was extremely beneficial for us, okay? So this is a, a really great document and I actually incorporate some scriptures and things here. 